Good day, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on Supporting Configuration Management, Part 1. Today I'm going to be talking about what configuration management is, and then I'm going to discuss some documentation. With that, let's go ahead and jump into this session. First up is configuration management. Why do we need configuration management? Because even fairly small modern networks can get very complex very fast. Configuration management, or CM, is a discipline that is used to evaluate, coordinate, approve, deny, or implement change in or to an IT system. Configuration management plays a vital role in any network beyond the most simplistic of small office home office networks. It helps to ensure that the network runs efficiently and smoothly. Network administrators and support staff will play a vital role in developing and implementing any CM system or process. Now that you know what configuration management is, let's talk about documentation. Documentation plays a key role in any configuration management system that gets developed. In the CM process, documentation is used to help evaluate and plan proposed changes. Documentation is also used to help in asset management, network maintenance, and vendor evaluations. The documentation that is created will depend upon the complexity of the systems under consideration. However, even if your organization doesn't implement a true CM style, some documentation should still be kept to reduce the burden on network personnel and to ease administrative management of the network. Some of the documentation that should be kept include policies and procedures. Policies are a set of guidelines that establish how the network is to be configured and operated. They also set the expected behavior of the people within the organization. As a general rule, policies are put into effect at the mid to upper management level. Procedures, on the other hand, are a set of documents that detail how the policies are to be implemented. As a general rule, procedures are set by the management of the level that's affected by the policy, and they get down to the step-by-step -step process of how to do things. Asset management documentation should also be maintained. This covers a broad category of documentation that's often used to help in the change management process. Asset management documentation contains detailed information on what assets are present, it also includes the maintenance history for those assets. This documentation is often used to help track update and upgrade cycles. Physical network diagrams should also be kept. These are a map or diagram of all network devices and how they connect. A physical network diagram specifies the cabling, connectors, and physical cabling runs. It will also include cable management documentation, which is considered a subcategory of the physical network diagram. The cabling management documentation will contain a wiring scheme, which establishes the type of cabling and the connectors used. It also defines the allowed standards for wiring those cables. Your documentation should also include a logical network diagram. It's similar to a physical network diagram, but more detailed. It provides details on the IP address scheme, active ports, protocols that are allowed on the network, etc., etc. Your logical network diagram also details connected networks. So what local area networks are present, or which virtual local area networks are present, so on and so forth. Part of your logical network diagram also details IP address utilization. IP address utilization can greatly affect the efficiency and performance of the network. By allowing you to know which LANs or VLANs have space on which nodes can be added. Your physical and logical network diagrams may be combined into a single document. Vendor documentation also plays a role in supporting configuration management. It covers a broad category of documentation that can include the approved vendor list, the vendor approval process, and purchase order documentation. 
There are some common vendor documents that you should know. First up is the Memorandum of Understanding or MOU. This is an agreement between two or more organizations that detail how those organizations are to take some common course of action. It is also often referred to as a letter of intent. It is not legally binding, but it does often lead towards a binding agreement. Then there is the Statement of Work, or the SOW, the SOW. It's a detailed document that specifies what work is to be performed, the expected outcome or deliverables, and the timelines to perform the work. The Statement of Work is often a key document in project management. Included in some vendor documentation is a Master License Agreement, or MLA. This is a legal agreement between two entities in which one agrees to pay the other for the use of a specific piece of software or software package for a specific period of time. Often, instead of being called a master license agreement, it is referred to as just a license agreement. Last up is the service level agreement, or SLA. It details the allowable amount of response time the vendor has to resolve an issue or problem. Most commonly, it is associated with a service contract. That concludes this session on Supporting Configuration Management Part 1. I talked about configuration management, and then I moved on to documentation. On behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session, and I look forward to doing another one.